Marco and welcome back to a new Precious Plastic video. This time we're in the capital city of Kenya, Nairobi, which is also the home of the biggest slum in Africa called Kibera and it is also the home of the 13th biggest dump site in the world called Dandora, very close to the city, big massive mountains of a lot of waste and at the same time it also has a big national park with zebras, giraffes, lions, you name it, pretty much in the heart of the city. So quite interesting, diverse mix. And in the midst of this is Plastic Rafiki that started as a school group, but now really developed as a fully implemented pressure plastic system in a school, as well as their machine builders in East Africa, providing the communities around here with pressure plastic machines. Yes, let's check out Plastic Rafiki and have fun. So if you have been around for a bit, you might actually remember this short clip we took of these guys from a visit a while ago. This is the teacher. Hey, hey. So I'm, I'm Maciej Suda. I'm a design teacher here at the International School of Kenya. Uh, Plastiki Rafiki is uh, an extracurricular activity it's run by students. Um, and we build machines, we create products, uh, and we help set up workshops around, around Kenya. We have built several machines. The extruder, the injector, the shredder, the bicycle shredder, but also the compression that works to make big plastics, a charcoal compressor machine. And we also build this uh, biogas compressor. We have got a washing machine that washes the plastic. And we have built a lot of machines, about over 30 of them, actually. So in the meantime, they have actually set up two workshops, one in the high school for the ones who are really doing more projects and more design, and one for the middle school for the younger students to learn more about plastic. This is like where the students work, yeah. Every, every room we have a bunch of laser cutters, we got the resin printer. The middle school workshop is called the Innovation Studio. We have like the space for robotics and sort of like the digital aspect. The wood workshop, metal, and in the back are plastic recycling machines. So they have injection, they've got their shredder, and an extruder, and an oven. They also have laser cutters here in this workshop so we can do some rapid prototyping with molds. So especially for the students who start in the middle school and then go to high school, yeah. they are already like really plastic experts and yeah. are, can build on that experience. Exactly. Amazing. Okay, but let's actually jump back quickly a little bit to how they even started and how it went along um, to how they are doing now. So the first year was, was, was like uh, the first two machines and figuring out why the plastic's not melting or why it's, <laughs> or why it's bur smells like burnt and yeah. you know, and, and all the just, just the properties of plastic. The second year we built the next two machines. So we built the extruder, we built the injection machine, and then suddenly, wow. We were lucky, so Faris, who's been with us the whole time, is, is amazing. My name is Faris Murunga Shem. I'm here as a plastic rafiki expert. And in the old school, I'm a fab lab assistant. Yeah, so he means he's been doing it for six years now. So he's, he's like kind of the machine and plastic expert yes, now. Yes, and then the students go straight to him uh, with any, any questions. Is this possible? Is it not possible? How does it work for students? They choose T DT, design technology? That's what I teach, but there's a club. So there's a club, there's a called, club. A club called Plastic Rafiki, and we meet on Thursdays. And to be honest, we meet every day, basically, after right. school. Kids come by here and stuff, so that's a club. And they, and they meet and they basically do all these prototypes. So they do the, the molds and the products and the finances and the marketing and that sort of stuff. And then as DT, it's just another medium. Like before we had this workshop here, they would we had wood, aluminum, steel as options, and now mm. we have plastic, plastic as, an as another option, mm. which is great, you know what I mean? So it just yeah. means that they use it as a medium. This was actually probably our most successful project. You'll see some examples over there, but we did these, these warning signs, these Hatari signs. Shovel in the, in the rake, but now we have like our little roller thing. That's kind of fun. Mm. Takatongs, really simple, easy thing, but it's kind of cool that it's made of recycled plastic and it's used to collect plastic. And it's just a chessboard, but it's like, it's kind of a nice interlocking mechanism. So here, this is fun. This is for this is a big up for precious plastic climbing wall grips. We made this yesterday. I'm sure, I'm you sure. it will be successful. Check it out. It came out. Your Still warm. First, first climbing hold, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm the teacher advisor for the marketing team. So we've got three, four students that handle most of our social media. With like working with the design team and stuff like that, it's really cool. Uh, for students to get creative with different ways of documenting the process. Yeah, uh, the marketing team pretty much works close with them. So it's like if there's something that's being produced, uh, they let us know and then we kind of get to record like the whole process. And it's, and it's really a circular flow because with these guys, when they promote us as a club, 
there are people that reach out to us and ask us to do things and then it's it's it's, it's yeah. basically a cycle we relate like in class when we're teaching stuff we talk about the secret figi all the time yeah because it's such a good example of like rapid prototyping using different materials using sustainable materials so as a design teacher it's awesome to have that yeah. sort of um to have this workshop here so actually, as Plastiki Rafiki had successfully built up their machines and workspace, they got a lot of attention from communities around them. And we as Precious Plastic, when we got inquiries from especially the East African community, we directed all requests directly to those guys because we knew they had success. So they ended up getting a lot of inquiries and then built the machines for the community and provided them with trainings to set up their own recycling workspaces. So you have 15 workshops now kind of set up? <coughs> yeah. Two in Turkana, two at the coast, three in Nairobi, and one setting up in Kibera. Our model is usually like we make machines and when we, when we fabricate the machines, we then uh, do training on site. So they come right. to our lab. Yeah and then uh, they work with us for a week or so, and then we usually give them three or four molds to start with. Our first workspace, which is the one I mentioned, the Football Mass Mathare one, was the first one we set up outside ISK, and we liked the, the model that it's used to fund football after school programs, so we sort of really worked with them very closely, and we still work with them closely. ISK ensured that the starting capital was in place by providing machinery that is used in the recycling process. They have done this and they have always supported this project by providing whatever is required and, and it has helped in sustenance. And the other ones, we just get requests um, for new molds and stuff. They need a, a new coaster mold for their Nomads restaurant, so then we'll, we'll cut that for them and then right. send, send it to them, but that's kind of our involvement. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned before the Rhino Flashers Hatari ones, because that was we, we had an order of, I'm trying to remember the exact number, but I think maybe 50,000 of them initially and what was nice about that is that there's no way we can make 50,000 here there's no way Mathari can make 50,000 so we actually um, wrote to a whole bunch of like we all tried to get in workshop. touch with all our workshops yeah. and said listen we have a contract you know we'll send you the molds and then you know you you send us these uh, these yeah. flashers back so yeah. it's kind of a nice way to like and then you touch managed base. to make those we did yeah, yeah no if you go to Los Sabana you'll see them like the whole electric fence it's a rhino fence so they so always when you get those new requests that's kind of a new student project now. Yeah, usually. I mean, I mean, for me, it's, it's like it's magic because what you have is I'm a design teacher, so you want to you want to get students want to solve challenges uh, to real world problems. For it's service learning too, so it's so it's mm. good for the community. Mm. So so you know, there's a workshop that wants in a new um, like a new gutter design. A new kind of gutter design. We use the extrusion machine, and we have like a stainless steel cylinder, and we coil the HTP coils around it, and then we just cut. One yeah, side of it, a strip. and then it can like bend over the corrugations of corrugated roofs. So then, you know, here's a challenge. Let's see what we can do, and the students prototype, and we test stuff out, and then eventually, if it's a successful design, it goes, it goes out. Do you keep track a bit of like how you know uh, the impact, even from those workspaces? I guess it's hard. Really, so hard. We know ours roughly now yeah. way more than we did before because of the admin, admin team we set up. Yeah, I mean, I guess Brown is the person to talk to. This is Mr. Brown, right? Yes. Yeah. So I'm, um, I'm glad to say that it's pretty self-sustaining. Mm. So we don't have to get funding from out there. Um, but I will also report that the, the graph has been going down in terms of income and we're not sad about that because that's a decision we decided to make. Operating from a school, um, we realized that we were into a lot, mm. a lot of fairs, a lot of selling stuff. It generated a lot of income mm. for us, but we realized the overhead is way too much. There are others where we do custom requirements from plans, especially if it's something new mm. um, that we need to think about, get the students thinking. and The make, interesting stuff. Yeah, the interesting yeah. stuff. That we still do, and that provides the... Income. We make lots of money and then we spend lots of money, obviously. <laughs> so, 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 like at the end of the year, we don't have very much left. But like, do you have a rough number in mind? How much kilos? Kilos of plastic. Yeah. So an easy one to do would be just to do the math on plastic flashers alone would be probably two tons. The rest of the stuff at the moment is more like smaller scale. The metals, two kg, three yeah. kg there. But that was now a huge project. Yeah. We have right now 40 students uh, involved in Plastic Rafiki as a club, and that is been consistent for the last, let's say, four years. So I think if you talk about the impact, you're talking within four years, you've had over 200 students right. really involved. actively involved in recycling plastic. There are students contacting me that have graduated now, looking about setting up workshops in their community. Yeah, and then you have all the students that are taking classes and stuff. Yeah, we, we won a couple of awards just within the... Africa education sector and through that we've had that's how all these inquiries came in from different schools and stuff and how can we make this happen and stuff I, I might be wrong but I, I do think give it four or five years 
you'll have a lot of these international schools yeah. sort of setting up workshops, trying to copy a model yeah. um, like this. Ideally, it's not going to take another school six years to do it. Like it took yeah. us. So the idea is like, how can you do it in two years, one yeah. year, and have, yeah. a, have, a, have a sustainable workshop? Yeah. yeah, so I think there definitely is room for some sort of how-to type thing there. Yeah. Definitely. I got, a, I got a mission. No, it's yeah, good. Yeah, you I got a mission good. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so people, if you're interested in actually setting up precious plastic or any recycling thing in your school and are keen to learn from Plastic Year of Vicky how they set it up and get any tips and tricks from them, make sure you like this video and let us know in the comments if you would like that and what you would be interested in because that really shows us how much demand there is and can really motivate Plastic Year of Vicky to actually now start documenting and put it together for other people who want to start. Is there any reason to not start a precious plastic workspace in a school? Uh, <laughs> oh no, As you should absolutely start uh, precious plastic workshops in schools. It's like, it's like the perfect setting um, to get people involved early, get yeah. them to know more about uh, the global community surrounding this like cause and movement. I think actually it's, it's an awesome stuff to have as a school. Mm. It's perfect as a school because you, you get to prototype, um, you know, you, you're trying stuff out, you get to make mistakes, students should make mistakes, and yeah. they're learning from, and learn that. from that. Um, and I think, you know, you, you don't have the survival, you know, that a lot of these local workshops need, but yeah. I think it's a great model to have it working at schools, but then if you have these outreach workshops where you then, if something works really well, you can be like, this is a mold. You need to find a group of people who are extremely dedicated to, to the cause. Um, because as she said, you have to, if you center it around learning environment, that knowledge has to eventually be passed down to the next generations. And that will only happen if the original stimulus was people who are very passionate about this. For example, for us, it was Amani Kiruga, who is like a 2020 senior, uh, and Mr. Suter, who, uh, who is obviously extremely passionate about yeah. this plastic. So for advice for like potential schools who, wants to, who want to start this, make sure you have the engagement in your community to, to be able to do it. But once you do it, it's extremely rewarding. All right, that was it from Plastic Era Fiki in Nairobi. Pretty amazing their journey and how they have actually worked themselves out of trying to do a lot of things at the same time, but now really finding their focus and R&D and supporting their local community with machines and ideas. I hope it was inspiring. I hope that uh, this is motivating for many out there to actually start precious plastic or any sort of recycling thing in your school because everyone of us has plastic waste or deals with plastic. So if we can actually learn that from very young on, I think it's the best way to start. If you like these videos and the content we're sharing and the community members and what you can learn from then, subscribe to the channel. Make sure you keep updated with our uh, social media and everything and check out our Patreon page where you can support on a monthly basis and make sure we can keep this work up. Yeah, hope you enjoyed and see you around and see you in the next video. Ciao!